Hi, this is Dan Sullivan. I'd like to welcome you to the Multiplier Mindset Podcast. You know, a lot of people who have seen me for many years, and you know, my public appearances go back to the 1970s, and they say you're so comfortable in public. You seem totally at ease when you're on stage in the spotlight. And I say, well, you have to realize that this is a learned skill. This doesn't come naturally at all. There's a scale which measures whether you're an extrovert or an introvert. And a lot of people would say, well, you're very extroverted. You're easy with people. You seem to be able to meet people and carry on conversations with them. And I say, well, you know, on all the scales that measure introversion and extroversion, I'm an introvert. One of the best definitions of the difference between those two things is that if you were left on your own for two or three days, what would you do with the time? And my answer is I would spend all my time during those two or three days alone. It wouldn't occur to me to phone somebody else or to meet anyone during those two or three days. And one is I can get a lot of reading done. I can do a lot of thinking. So that's how I was born. And then my birth order in my family is such that by the time I was conscious and walking around, all my older brothers and my sister were off at school. The younger brothers are quite a bit younger, seven and eight years. And I didn't have any playmates until I was six years old. So I learned how to entertain myself and I learned how to teach myself and educate myself on a farm. You know, I grew up on a farm, 70, 80 acres, 10 acres of it are woods. And I've, you know, in this series, I tell the story about the wonderful thing of being able to go into the woods on my own when I was six years old. But I really, really learned how to keep myself entertained and keep myself interested and keep myself busy. And when I arrived at school, one of my biggest experiences, I didn't find any of the other children really all that interesting because none of them really spent their time thinking and making up things like I did. And I learned how to talk to adults and ask adults questions. And I found that six-year-olds didn't know anything, so they weren't very interesting to talk to or ask questions. So all this suggests to you that you know, I had sort of a solitary existence for most of my life. And I realized that I was very, very uncomfortable standing up and talking in front of a group like you will have to do periodically if you're in school. You know, you have to give up and give answers and reports. And I found I was very uncomfortable. But I also observed that everybody else in my family was. So there was nothing to be learned from my parents who weren't public speakers and my siblings were not public speakers. I don't know when it was, but I think it was midway through my teens. I said, you know, if you're going to make it out in the world, you're going to have to get comfortable with this whole thing of being in public, presenting in public, performing in public, and you have to be good at that. And I don't know why I learned that. But I did two things when I was 14 years old, and I now lived in that town. We had moved off the farm by the time I was 14 years old, and there was an organization called Toastmasters, and Toastmasters still exists, and Toastmasters teaches you public speaking, how to give speeches, how to give talks. It doesn't cost very much. I went and I inquired, and I found out you had to be 18 years old to join. But I stayed with it, and I said, well, why don't you make an exception with a 14-year-old? I said, I'll do everything you want. I want to get good at this. And so I joined Toastmasters. It was hard to prepare a talk, and it was hard to stand up in public and go through all the nervousness and feeling, you know, I'm not going to remember what to say, and I don't think I'm going to look all that good. But I persisted with Toastmasters. And the other thing that I did was to go into theater. So every year there were a couple plays and I would volunteer for the play, take whatever role was available. You know, I usually always got something because I was very purposeful about it. 
And then I developed this thought, well, why don't you go further when you graduate from high school? Why don't you go to theater school? So in the early 1960s, so I graduated from high school in 1962, I got a job with the FBI in Washington, D.C., and I worked nights. Then I would take like a two-thirds curriculum at a university, and there were three theater universities in the United States then that were very famous. One of them was Yale University. The other one was Northwestern University in Chicago. And then there was Catholic University in Washington, D.C. And I was accepted into the drama department in Washington. And, you know, I started learning theater skills. And I always remember a story about theater, which really, really got me focused in the right direction. And right at that time, when I was about 18 or 19, Richard Burton, who is a very famous Shakespearean actor in the UK, you know, he was an amazing actor, amazing speaker. He had become famous because of his relationship with Elizabeth Taylor right around that time. But he got a role on Broadway playing Hamlet, Shakespeare's Hamlet, which is one of the most extraordinarily difficult roles that any actor can actually take on. You spend more time on stage and you have more lines in Hamlet than any other role in the English language. So I just decided to write him a letter and I was asking him all questions, how to prepare myself as an actor. And about two and a half weeks later, I got a handwritten, three-page handwritten letter which to this day I think was totally legitimate. I think it was from Richard Burton. He was famous for answering his fan mail, very beautifully written. You know, he answered my questions, which I don't remember now what I asked for. But he said, I just want to leave off here with a question. Do you want to become an actor or do you want to become a star? Because the training to become an actor is totally different from becoming a star. He said, so if you want to be an actor, he says, go to the most prestigious acting school, best acting school that you can find, and go through and graduate and do everything they teach you, and then gradually work your way up through the acting ranks from theater to theater to theater. And then he says, after you know 10 or 15 years, if you stay with it, you'll probably be a very good, competent, professional actor. He says, but if you want to be a star, bypass the education altogether and just go down and find some group, church group, local community group, and be the star. And when you outgrow that group, go to another group and be the star, but never have any role where you're not being the star. And he said, you know, the training to become an actor is totally different from being the star. Then his very last sentence, and this is why I think it was legitimate, he said, by the way, I never wanted to be an actor. From that point forward, I realized I didn't want to be an actor. I wanted to be a star, but I wanted to be a star in my own way. I wanted to be a star in my own situation. And now, 50 years later, when I look at Strategic Coach and I look at you know, the workshop program that we've created over the last almost 30 years, and my 43 years of coaching, I realized that I've created my own theater, I've written my own script, I've got my own stories, and I'm the star, just like I am in this video presentation. So I started off with an intuition that I had to become good at something, and I stayed with it. I'm 50 years at it, actually 55 years now, at overcoming the sense of being uncomfortable on stage, feeling very, very introverted, and everything like this. And so everything that you see today, if you think I'm a really great presenter, if you think I'm really great in my coaching role, I have to tell you, it's entirely learned, and it's a function of massive amounts of concentrated effort and hard work for more than half a century. The lesson of my theater experience is you have to see yourself in the future how you want to be. Some of that is going to naturally come about simply because of what you're very talented at. So you have to have that. You have to have a talent for the thing that you're going to 
But there may be areas where skills are required which aren't your natural talent, but you can become very, very good at. As long as you realize that you're going to develop these skills in your own way, and you're going to develop them for your own purpose, and you're going to utilize them in ways that have only to do with your goals, then you will reach a point of skill where people can't tell whether it's natural or whether it's developed. And the truth is it doesn't really matter because it's not about the skill, it's about the goal that you achieved using the skill. So I'm not a natural business person, but I've become a very good entrepreneur. I've become a very, very good developer along with my partner, Bab Smith. We've developed a really extraordinarily good and successful company That wasn't natural to me, but I developed those skills. So it's half and half. Some of it is just natural talent, and my feeling is you've got to maximize your natural talent, but you're going to have to develop some other dimensions. You're going to have to develop other skills. That's going to take time, and it's going to take hard work, and you're going to have to go through fear. You're going to have to go through discomfort and uncertainty to get there. And the real great successes weren't the ones who were just naturally talented. They're the ones who made maximum use of their natural talents, but they added other dimensions to that really had to be worked at and developed. So here's a question I'd like to ask you. When you really identify the ideal situation for you, and let's take five years down the road of how you're operating the kind of success that you're having, the kind of impact that you're having. What part of that vision is really made up of things that you're just naturally good at and which things are going to require that you add some other skills which are actually going to require quite a bit of work to get there? What I'm doing right now is a skill that I had to develop. I wasn't naturally born with this skill, but I've learned how to do it, and I'm still nervous before I do it, but I've noticed the results keep getting better and better. People keep complimenting me on my performance. They keep talking how amazed they are. I can just talk right off the top of my head. And I said, lots of hard work, lots of discomfort, lots of courage, and there comes a point where you can't tell what I've gone through to get here.